Okay, thank, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'm working right now, as Cynthia said, at Lockheed Martin, applying all of the all of these CNA process to a Air Force system under development. I'm working as a security engineer, so I can talk to you a little bit later if you'd like about some of the aspects from the contractor side. But right now, I want to just get right into the process. I have a lot of material, and some of it you probably know, but I'll um, go over it quickly again. So here. My talk is this, the DOD certification and accreditation process. I'm going to talk about um, some of the definitions that are important to the process. I'm going to introduce some of the key policies and regulations, discuss the approach to certification and accreditation, and discuss the CNA process, and describe roles and responsibilities of the process because um, it's hard to say where you'll be in your next job or jobs two, two, three times from now, and you may be part of the process in some role. Just to set the stage real quick, here's these, there's an important definition here, certification. Certification is different than accreditation. Certification is the comprehensive evaluation of the technical and non-technical security features of the AIS and the other safeguards. In other words, it's a, it's a um, look at what was put in place to mitigate against any of the vulnerabilities of the system. Accreditation now is a, a formal declaration by a designated approving authority that the AIS is approved to operate in a particular mode of operation with a prescribed set of safeguards. What that is really is a management decision to operate the system and the accreditation authority accepts any risk that's involved that's remaining based on what the certification showed. One of the key terms is, which I mentioned is the designated approving authority and that's really the, the actual official who's doing the accreditation that's accepting that responsibility. Yes? If you want, right, that's fine. Your experience, have you ever run into a situation where a, a level of security uh, that was considered uh, inadequate by one activity would be considered adequate by another? Activity? In other words, the DAA in one activity would approve would approve a system where, whereas in another activity, you may not opt not to do. You mean, no, you mean where the system's is being used, actually in the environment where the system is being used? I would say that that's, that happens. I mean, depending on what's going on in the world, for example, they may, an, an accreditor may decide that it's worth turning the system on and using it anyway. I, I know of a system where there was a, some part of the, the InfoSec was not in place, but given the situation, they had to use the system. So that approving authority accepted that risk because it comes down to what does the mission require and you know without the information like for example one of the conditions that the navy ter uses is a term called battle short i mean if if there was a real battle going on and, and you needed performance out of the system you may turn off all the security mechanisms just to get things going and and yes so that does happen 
Now, a term called principle of crediting authority, some don't necessarily see that term as much as others because I think it's, um, it's really a DSCID 116, the uh, defense um, uh, intelligence effort, really. And it deals with the National Foreign Intelligence Board members being the, the principal crediting authority on systems that process intelligence in their respective area. And um, they can delegate that authority down, in, except for the case where it's a multi, when it's a multi-level secure system. Those cannot be delegated down, so they must be accredited by the director of NSA, director of DIA, or the DCI, director of central intelligence. Sometimes you have a, t a, t a situation that calls for a joint accreditation when you have multiple government activities that share the same AI AIS or you have, a, for example, you have a system that process command and control data but also intelligence and then you have to look at who would be the um, responsible DAA on the intelligence side and on the command and control side and you do a joint accreditation. And the ISSO, or sometimes the, referred to as the Information Systems Security Manager, is the person responsible to the DAA to ensure that the system continues to operate in a secure manner throughout the entire life cycle. Generally, the ISSM is, is located at the site where a system is installed or at a site where you're accrediting. Now, here's some of the policies. You know, the CNA process came about because of all the policies and regulations that were written to require us to build these secure systems. Some of the policies were written by Congress, the public laws and national security decision directives. OMB actually has written security requirements or security policies. And then, of course, we have the OSD and NIST, NCSE, GAO, GSA, even, and, some, and the federal agencies have their policies, too. But. I'll just quickly mention OMB Circular A130 because that applies to everybody in the federal government. And that really talked about um, establishing requir uh, some requirements for security, that you had to develop an information security plan, and um, you had to do some training. The, and that A130 also stresses the contingency planning, the emergency planning, because if your system goes down and you have no backup because the building caught on fire, then they look at OMB, A130 looks at that as a security problem. Now here are the DOD <coughs> regulations that, that um, you probably see more of, and that basically is, is the um, regulation that talks about the, how to classify and downgrade and declassify information. It's not really InfoSec specific, but it's important to know about it. And here's the, one of the key documents, though, for the DOD, the 5200.28. And it actually defines the minimum security requirements and manda the mandatory ones also. And that is often referred to as the Orange Book. If you're familiar with the Orange Book, it, it was a standard one time. It was a guideline not necessarily required to be implemented by the DOD, but more for developed for vendors. And then it became an actual DOD standard in a, in a um, directive was written to incorporate it as a standard, and um, that still exists today. But it is under rewrite, as Cynthia mentioned, that so many of the policies are being rewritten. But today, it, it's, it dra rewrites in draft, but not finished yet. And it requires the certification and accreditation program. So as I say, these, these requirements all string together, or these policies string together and require certification and accreditation. And it stresses life cycle management, which I would say most of the DOD documents tend to do that. And it applies to all of the um, OSD, the military departments and services, and all of DOD, essentially. Now, the, the um, Director of Central Intelligence has a directive also, DSCA 116. So if you're working with intelligence systems or, pro or systems that process intelligence, you have to follow DSCA 116. So now you have A130 to worry about 5200.28 and DSCA 116. And it has requirements also based on the mode of operation, how you're going to, to run the system. And it has a lot of information about networking and how you're, what you're connecting up to, to um, the system. And it drives some requirements, requires the security plan and 
your requirements documentation. So it has a flavor of a certification and accreditation process in it also. It doesn't conflict, though, with anything else written. And DIA has DIA Manual 50-4, which implements the, the DSCA 116 and the DOD 5200.28. And basically, it designates the director of DIA as a principal accrediting authority for all DOD intelligence information systems, also referred to as DOTUS, except those supporting signals intelligence, which is director of NSA. And D the DIAM 50-4 implements a site-based accreditation, which I'll talk about in a minute. The director of DIA is the um, principal accrediting authority for all the DOTA systems, which process SCI. So based on all these rules and these regulations and directives, there could be a number of approaches to CNA. And over, the t over time, there have been. There's been a system-based <laughs> approach. There's been a site-based approach, and we're moving toward an infrastructure-centric approach. If you think about the, um, I'll talk about these a little bit more, but these are some of the directives that, that map to those approaches, and um, GCCS is, and the DIAM 50-4 is so more of a site-based, and the infrastructure-centric approach is now being done by the DITSCAP, the DOD, information technology certification and accreditation process. So I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be site-based or any of the other approaches. A systems-based approach is the system was built with the appropriate safeguards for deployment and operation according to its concept of operations. And it didn't necessarily look at what all was there because the systems were fielded as independent systems back a lot of times you had to have a workstation or for each indie, each separate system. And that's, you know, the Orange Book worked just fine for that kind of a, an approach. And there was no requirement or emphasis put, put on using any common components. You just built the system. And you can, that process is obviously a few years old. And the CNA, of course, concentrated on the system. Sure. A couple slides back, you're talking uh -huh. about that uh, you're certifying certify an authority for right. intelligence information systems. The, the information that I'm kind of curious about, okay, what exactly is a specific intelligence information system? Where does that, where is the line drawn between normal communications and intelligence information systems? At what level? Is it just secret, top secret? Uh, so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's. I think that's, um, a lot of times it, the, the um, DOD, like the DOTA systems are really, they're SCI usually, and the DSCID is u are usually SCI. The, um, I'm sure there's intelligence in the, in, the, um, in the GCCS, for example, but there, there was an old term, win intel and things like that, that they're doing away with. So it's, I can't give you a really specific good definition or a, a way to, say what's on this side of the line versus that side of the line. And I think that's one of the things you need to do is if you have a question is you start talking to your accreditors or who might be your accreditors and ask them to help make that decision. And that's part of the process of certification and accreditation is to actually determine who your accreditors are. Because sometimes it is a little fuzzy who might, who might be your, your designated proving authority. So I could research for that for you and get some, a better answer for you. Jane Wicks, uh, DIA. DIA. Uh, system under DIA responsibility. Yes. And the DOTUS is the, is the yellow side of the, the auto hand falls under DIA, but it's jointly accredited with DISA for the, uh, the red side. I, th I, don't, I don't know exactly. I know Jane Wicks is accredited by DIA. I'm not sure which communication systems are jointly accredited, though, between the two. I could I could find that out. I haven't dealt with the, the comm side that much, but I know that when you when you you run at a site, you might have both, and so you do have to to deal with if there is any say 
if there's one side in, in the side that you're accrediting, you have to, to look at what they have and to verify that, that it doesn't perturb the security posture of whatever it is that you're accrediting. So I could get you better guidance on that if there happens to be some written. I could get it for you. It sounds easy to do this until you get right down to it. And then you get there and find a, a, site, or a system there and you say, wait a minute, what's that system? So DIA site-based approach, they looked at what's at a site because they, um, as, you, as you know, everything is connected together. We have a network and everybody's on the same workstation or, you know, we have a workstation with all the same systems. So it was getting difficult to just certify systems without looking at what they were connected to and it wasn't secure doing it that way. So they come up with a site-based approach which made it more cost-effective also. So they did it in four phases. They didn't, they, um, baseline the sites to find out what all was at the site. Basically did that in phase one. In phase two, they had the certifying organization, which in the case of DIA, for example, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force are their certifying organizations. They went out and did the testing, site security testing and evaluations on the sites to see that uh, the, the um, systems were operating properly. And then they made a recommendation to, the, to DIA as the um, DAA. Now, phase three was the effort to, to integrate the DOTUS migration systems and transition to a DOTUS client server environment. That's basically when they were getting off of the mainframes into a more of a client server environment. And the migration system effort, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically there was a look, they looked across the intelligence systems that serviced the different intelligence mission areas and found, you know, more than one system servicing the same area and decided that it was not cost effective to, to maintain all of those different systems. And they determined which ones basically would be the systems that would live and evolve and then the other ones would, would um, sort of die off over time. And so then you only have a, a handful of what they consider migration systems. And so that makes it easy. Now they're built on the same environment, the client server environment, similar systems at different sites. At the, uh, so now you can do a site-based approach, go into a site, you already know pretty much what you're going to have there, and you have the baseline, and, and um, so you go into the phase four, where the DAA and the certifying organization go and verify that the sites are complying with all the uh, security rules and the program objectives, and that the site is secure. And so most, I would say most of the DA, DIA sites are at phase four right now. Now, the, um, what's happening, the, the DOTUS instruction is a document that's in draft that DIA is doing to implement some of the current, doc, current directives that are coming out, the DITSCAP among um, one thing. And um, so I won't talk a lot about that, but it's basically now prescribing compliance with the DII COE. So that's, that's basically what DIA is doing. Now we're moving to the infrastructure-centric approach, which is the foundation of the DITSCAP, the DOD um, Information Technology Security Certification Accreditation Program. And basically they're saying, if we have a common infrastructure, we could look at what the residual risk is to the system. And um, if everybody uses the same infrastructure, then um, We'll, and we could look at the system threats and the information and we could look at the mission objectives and decide whether or not the site is secure or the system is secure enough to run. And it goes, this last sentence goes back to what you were saying about look at the mission. How important is, is, is this mission? What's the value to the DOD? How much do you have to build, how much security do you have to put into the system to be able to run this mission? So it's getting to be, some, some call it the risk <coughs> management as opposed to risk avoidance, which system, the system-based approach was. When did that concept first come into vogue, the centric system? You know, if, if you really think about it, I think you could really say a lot of these, if you looked at a site, you could say that it was a bit infrastructure-centric even though 
it wasn't thought of that way. We didn't have the DII COE and things like that. But when you had the CSES, uh, the Client Server Environment by DIA, that starts to look at an infrastructure centric. Although they call it a site based approach, it's built on the same infrastructure. So you could go to the, the Jack Molesworth, you could go to, to UCOM, and you're going to find the same client server environment. But essentially, Wemix did that years and years ago. They prescribed what the, what the hardware was, and they built the, all the security features into the operating systems. So in some respects, I, I think you had some infrastructure-centric effort going on many years ago. But it's, it's become the, the word now. So. I would say we could look back 20 years and say it really started back then. And so if you, as I said, you had the CSESS developed for DOTUS, and it really became part of the foundation for the DII COE, uh, Software Requirement Specifications. You had a member of the, of the DII InfoSec division that was part of the team building the DII COE requirements. So you saw, you saw a little bit now the migration of the intelligence requirements and systems and infrastructure over to the command control side, which becomes defense-wide now. Okay. Yes? Do you see these evolutionary changes as being changes in the way we, we think and we want to work, or are they rationalizations for the fact that we can no longer dictate the market? So for example, we thought we'd build it, we'd write the orange book and then the vendors would come, and they did. So right. we were stuck with, uh, with standards we couldn't meet. And do you see that this is just really a complicated way to say, okay, well, we'll take Windows MT and it'll work because we have this paper? Well, not, it's, it's a little of both. I mean, we also were saying, you know, the, the DOD has been saying long, for a long time, use COTS, use commercial stuff. And basically, um, everybody says, great, I've got all these COTS products. How do I string them together? And what do I have? So it's a chicken and egg situation. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's, I think we're trying to make, I know we, we, you had, like I said, you had the um, intelligence world building its set of standards, you had the command and control world building its set of standards, and now we're going to build them all the same across the system, which, as you can see, dictates er a change in every process and every regulation. But I, I, I know that there was definitely a problem with vendors complying, it's not cost effective for them to build all this and get it through the evaluation process. They can build systems to be compliant, like B2 compliant or you know C2 compliant, but that means they built the requirements in, but they didn't have it evaluated by the um, NCSC. And the evaluation process is what was costing so much time. And products have to move along. The commercial marketplace just moves. And they don't have time to wait for this evaluation, so they just press on and we'll come out with the next release. So I think there's a lot of that. I mean, and, and money, for sure, dic has dictated a change in process. You know, we just don't have the same amount of money to build all these stovepipe systems that we had and try to interconnect. Also, just trying to operate all these things. I mean, if you're sitting at, a, at your desk and you have all these systems that have to have their own little infrastructure and you have to have a password for every operating system on, and you have four or five workstations, drive you crazy. So I think, I think that, that the pace of the world and technology is driving a lot of the change in the process. Do you, have, do you agree? No, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I, worry that we, I, mean, I worry we just keep lowering the standard until we can create a piece of paper that the DAA can sign. And that gives such a false sense of security to people who aren't informed. They say, yes, I have an accredited system, but in reality, Right, and that what that you know it becomes difficult to to write a risk assessment, for example, and because you have to get really to to do what you're saying to preclude that happening, you have to get very detailed, very technical on your risk assessment, and that takes digging into an operating system, for example, and um, I sometimes wonder, you know, how you're going to do that, how you're going to is it cost effective to do all that, so so you accept some some assessment by someone. And the DITS cap, I think, the, the DITS cap process itself is hoping to, to find, say, products or systems so that, that 
if they can tell you what the system does or what the product does, if you have, an, an, if you have a need for something that ha meets those requirements, you can just go and get that system and use it or use parts of it. And so you don't have to then analyze everything because you'd, you'd already have an analysis built by whoever built that system or whoever designed that system. So there's a lot of effort going, going on to try to make all of this work. But I mean, I agree, it's, it's fast. And, and if you talk to purists, and I, Cynthia can find plenty of those, because we we've, um, know a few people that go to conferences that, and basically, you can't secure anything if you talk to some of them. So you just do the best you can and accept the risk. And you look at what's published, the, the cert advisories and stuff, you know, if a hole is found, you have to patch it and things like that. And that's, I mean, you just have to do the best you can. There's plenty of stuff written about NT not being secure, but you can see the movement to NT it's happening. Because at one point, you're not going to be able to maintain the system if nobody supports it anymore. So you, you almost are being forced by the market to do things. So it's an interesting situation. We could talk about this all day. <laughs> Yes. Part of the problem going to this kind of thing where you get an approved hardware list. Mm -hmm. I just tried last week. The fastest machine I can find on the approved hardware list is a P200. And I hope to God they still make them next week because everything else in the list you can't even buy anymore. And the box I have is not like you get compliance, so right. I'm stuck. Were you looking at the EPL, the evaluated product list, or what, what list were you looking at? Oh, okay. But that's kind of what you were alluding to and the gentleman at the front, we've gone to this network centric mm -hmm. approach because what I'm willing to accept is a risk, he may not be. And if my wire is connected to your wire, you assume my liability. We're in that situation here. Because mm -hmm. we're our DM, the Defense Manpower Data Center it runs. Well, they use 80% of our mainframe. Here. We, they, they fund 80% of the use of our mainframe, uh, but they have different accreditation criteria than we do. Uh, and it's just a it's borderline nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole security. I know. Problem. It's interesting, but it's challenging. So as you see now, we found this. We have the foundation for the DITS cap. The DITS cap is DOD instruction 5200.40, and it standardizes the approach to securing the entities of the defense information infrastructure, and that's the pur its purpose. And it applies to any system program strategy and any lifecycle methodology, which I think is good. It's attempt to be generic, and it's intended to be tailored. So now I'll talk about the process itself. This, I think, is a, a nice chart. It summarizes the four phases of the DITSCAP process. The de definition phase, verification, validation, and post-accreditation. I'll go into each of these phases in a little bit more detail. But as you can see here, in the definition phase, is you define your, you develop your mission needs and analyze your mission needs, which we do and now we develop what's called a system security authorization agreement, which is um, an actual s agreement that you sign, register the system, and negotiate the requirements. But I'll go, uh, this is just a nice slide to have, and I'll show you the real busy DITS, official DITS cap slide. It tells you the same thing, a little bit more difficult, more of a flow chart. But I'll go into the phases so you understand them. Phase one definition is where you gather and assess your data and you prepare and execute your certification and accreditation plans. Basically, you document your mission need and you um, register the system, which essentially I think is, is um, if you think about all the acquisition process, that's, it's all part of that. And you, you um, develop a, the SSAA, the system security certification or authorization agreement. And you negotiate that. That's one of the key things. That's where you define you, who your, your accreditors are, who your certifiers are going to be. You have user representatives and your program managers. And you negotiate 
Who's going to do what in this, in this um, process? And actually, this, the SSAA is a living document. It, there's an outline for it in the DITSCAP instruction itself. It's, the outline itself is about two and a half pages. It covers everything. It includes, it describes the system, describes the architecture, describes the users, describes the level of the um, classification of all the data. Goes, talks about the environment, talks about risk. It, it's there. I, I have copies of the agreement. You can have, I'll have Cynthia make copies. But basically, the DISCAP process wants you to get agreement on this, that everybody agrees, so that, you know, you're down the road when you're in the middle of some pro part of this process, somebody doesn't change their mind and try to start something over. And that's, that's really a good thing. And, and um, so then you, when you have all that finished, now you don't have to finish that entire SSAA in this phase. You at least start it and get the parts of the SSAA finished that you can and you can add to it. It's a living document. Then you move into phase two, the verification, which part of this process then takes that agreement and now looks at the system development activity, looks at, analyzes the system, looks at how this, what security requirements were built in the system and how they were built, and um, decides you know, if they're adequate. And if not, maybe you have to go back and do some reanalysis. But basically, most of your, your whole system development effort, I would say, is in this phase. When you, when you develop your observations, your reports, your risk assessments, and what you might have. And so at the end of this, you say, OK, the system's ready for certification, which is where you bring in your certification authorities or organization. And you do your testing and your exams, inspections demos where you really test the security features of the system to see that they, that they work, that the features do mitigate the vulnerabilities that are in the system and determine what vulnerabilities remain, also known as your residual risk. And you complete any other portions of the SSAA that, that come about at that phase, during that phase, and then you, the certifier certifies the system and makes a recommendation to the accrediting authority on whether or not to accredit it. Now, I call it a system, but that's just for the purpose of the briefing. It's easier to do that. And um, so accreditation is either granted or it's not granted. Sometimes you get an interim approval to operate the system, for example. Maybe there are some vulnerabilities that need to be fixed, but they're not very severe. So you might get an interim, interim approval with some, some statement that says you must fix these in 30 days or whatever. And so then you may, your system is basically accredited, gets accredited, and you move on to phase four, which is your post-accreditation, where you operate the system and you, you continue to look for vulnerabilities and pay attention to those. And you have, there are system modifications that come about. You have to assess the modifications against the security mechanisms of the system to verify that the mechanisms still are in place, that still work properly. It doesn't really affect your security posture. And um, if it does, you want to go through another certification process, another certification and accreditation process. And generally, that you don't have to do a recertification re unless it's a really major change, a major update. So now I'll mention some of the key roles of the people involved in the CNA process. I mentioned earlier accreditation authorities, the DAA, the program manager, yes? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you have the ISSM, which is the Information System Security Manager, or is generally a member of a configuration control board, and it would be that person that would would always look at these changes to say yes, yes or no on how it affected the security posture. And I would say um, the current DSCID 116, for example, requires a reaccreditation at every five years. Now, how that's going to change, I'm not sure, but that would be something that would would catch that problem, 
situation you're talking about where you've had changes over a period of time. But I think that if, if you were, say, two, three years into something and you had a number of changes, an ISSM, it would, would be um, perfectly right in saying, I want a reaccreditation. Re so it really comes down to that. Or if a DAA, for example, had seen it over a period of time, that there's been a few changes, the DAA could call for it. I mean, anybody really could, especially if you have this negotiated agreement where you have everybody talking and working with each other. And, and in reality, that does happen. The certifying authorities and the accreditors do work pretty closely together, and the sites do. The sites call the, the accreditors a lot and talk about their situations. And, and so, sure, you could reaccredit a system if you think, I think we've had enough accumulation of changes. No problem. So, again, the key roles, the accreditation authority, program manager, and um, that generally means the program manager of the, the government program manager of the program that's being developed or system being developed, the user representative, because the user, the user knows what their mission is and what the requirements are and what they need to, to do to get the job done, and they know what the data is and what the importance of the data is and the classification of the data, so the user becomes very important. Certification authority is important here, the ISSM and, or the ISO, whichever term you use. And sometimes you have an information systems security working group where you may meet, have a group of people to meet monthly. Representatives of all of these people here participate usually in an ISSWG. And that's a place where you iron a lot of the, iron out some of your questions. And if you have maybe two or three ways to implement some security mechanism, you might want to talk about that at, at ISSWG. In a test planning working group, that's an important group because they have to be involved in the certification, testing, evaluation, planning. So uh, to give you a little more information about the accreditation authorities, here's some of what they have to do. They review and approve all the security safeguards and ensure that the um, safeguards are implemented. So basically, they review all the documentation that's written about the system. And they make sure that there's an incident reporting mechanism in place. Each of the different directives require your incident reporting differently. I, the DIA has a, you know, has a reporting within 10 days or whatever. But each, and now with, with the situation that's going on, the incident reporting is, has been stepped up. Within 24 hours, things must be reported clear to DIA at, for the DOTA sites. So you have to um, look at where you are and find out what your incident reporting situation is, what the requirements are. And you also have to ensure that the continuity program is in place, which is sometimes called COOP continuity of operation. And you verify your system interconnections, because systems are all connected these days. Here's some of the accreditation authorities. The joint staff, DISA, DIA, NSA, CIA. NEMA, FBI, Department of State, Department of Energy. And there's more on that top line. I didn't add them all, but they're basically all the NFIB members, which DSCID 116 calls out the actual office symbol <laughs> of the, N the National Foreign Intelligence Board members. And the commands, US commands, services, agencies can all do accrediting. I think that, you know, this is particularly now with the DITS cap, some of the accreditation, they're pushing accreditation down as opposed to at the higher levels. We used to do it at the, at the higher levels before you get someone from the joint staff. Now we're pushing it down to the commands because that, I mean, it makes sense. They're the ones who really have better feel for what the mission needs are and can accept that risk. Program managers have an important job. They oversee the implementation of all the security activities. They have to coordinate all of the security relevant portions of the program to include any, you know, the cost for the security and development and all the contractor efforts if there are any. Of course, they provide all the resources too, which is And as I mentioned the users before, but basically they have to provide all the input for the mission requirements and they end up getting involved in negotiating some of the system and the features of the system and the trade-offs of one mission need for another if, it, if the money runs out or whatever. 
but that's why it's really important that users be involved. And they can be an individual or, or an entire organization, depending on what the mission is. And they also have to provide input to the SSAA, which is um, part of the disagreement that's written. Now you have your certification authority and the certification team, which basically is the team that supports the DAA and looks at the technical aspects of the system. They're the technical experts. And they get very much involved in the, the testing and evaluation of the system. So they generally have a good understanding of all the technical volumes that are written about the system. And they are the ones who, in the end, make a recommendation on accreditation. So you can see they have to be pretty up on what's going on. And they generally get involved in the beginning phases and attend all the reviews, read all the documentation. And so oftentimes you talk, like if you have a policy that you need to be interpreted, you go to your certifying authority a lot and deal with, you know, get the answer from the certifying authority as opposed to the accreditor. And then the ISSM or the ISO is basically in charge of directing all the security activities. And um, they have to, the ISO has to review audit trails periodically. They have to main, they are actually responsible for maintaining the secure operation of the, of the site or the system or whatever it is by reviewing the audit trails, approving any um, new users, verifying that the mechanisms are working, that people's or changing their passwords and and um, but also in doing that they have to support the development of the SSAA as I said before and they they are responsible they are the point of contact back to the, the accrediting authority when the system's up and running <coughs> as to this to the operation of the system how secure it's running and they assist the team when they come out So basically, to summarize, I've covered some of the definitions and policies important to the CNA process. I gave you an overview of the CNA process. As I say, it's moving towards a more standardized, organized approach, which is the DITS cap. And um, you can, I think you can see that the prior CNA efforts were used in the development of the DITS cap. And um, I gave you an overview of the roles and responsibilities. Now I have a lot of backup slides which go into great detail on each phase of the DITS cap. They really are pulled from the DITS cap course. There's a whole course on the DITS cap itself. But I think what I'll do is take a couple minutes to talk about what the DITS cap is doing to the world of all of these regulations. I'll turn this off. Is that right? OK. Oh, this one. OK, good. The DITS cap was signed in December. It's been probably in work for since about 93 or so. And there was another effort being done by the NCSE called the Certification and Accreditation Handbook for Certifiers. And it was a document that was being written at practically the same time as the DITS cap. And so there was a, um, a decision to harmonize the two documents. And so there were a number of meetings where the people, advocates from both documents, sat around and talked about what to do. The SSAA, for example, had a different name. It was called a certification agreement. But basically, the contents and the outline was in the certifica certification or the CNA process handbook. And now you see it in the DITS cap with a different name, but pretty much the same content. So that's part of this harmonization effort. The decision was made at the DOD to, use the C to publish and use the CNA process handbook for certifiers first while they finished the DITS cap. So it was the near-term solution. Now the DITS cap was the long-term solution. And it was now published in December. And it applies to all of the DOD. <coughs> Excuse me. DOD 5200.28 is being updated to include that. I haven't seen any draft of it, but I know that there are drafts out. And so then you have the DSCID 116, which is in the process of being changed and, and updated also. And 
it also talks more about levels and certification levels and assurance levels that you find in the DITSCAP and also in the common criteria. So you have, so that's being updated. The DOTUS instruction, which is DIA's implementation of the DITSCAP, is in the process of being written. So you can see that all the CNA regulations and instructions and manuals or whatever are all in a state of rewrite based on the DITSCAP. And it was pretty strong when the DITSCAP came out in December that it applied to every DOD system. And um, I think if you've been around for a while, you've, you've seen the intelligence community march down a path with some of its own rules and regulations in the command and control world and down its path. But it's all one path now. And um, so they're trying, everybody's trying to implement it given their own missions on how to do it. Because the intel community has its, its interfaces with other parts too. So you can't just take everything, yes. Um, well, it's been required for uh, many years, I don't know, 10 years, that every system be accredited. Right. And yet, um, the evidence I hear from officers that pass through here is that it's kind of a joke um, that inspections coming through, they sort of throw something together. It really is, it's really not done. I'm sure it's done properly in, in many places. I can't get any statistics, it's just all anecdotal evidence. So what is being done, it seems to be important to people high up, to make sure that it's done properly, to enforce it effectively. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of things that, are, that they try to do. For example, if you look at this CNA process and where it fits in information operations, I would say it's an information, it's a, a defensive situation. It's an information warfare defensive type mission. Or, inform, or it fits under information assurance. There's a lot of talk about an effort to grow that information assurance effort in the DOD. But I read in the paper that it, the, the budget for it went to Congress and it was cut on one side or the other. I forget the House or the Senate cut it to zero. The other one didn't. So now that that has to be negotiated. It's a it's a real dilemma as far as I'm concerned because there's there's part of the community saying we have to do it, and another part of the community zeroing it out and not doing it. But but the other part of why some people where, where it appears that some people brush it off or pass it through or whatever, a lot of it is resource problem, a resource problem. If you're sitting at a site that, and, and with the downsizing, with everything that's going on, there's just too much work to do. I mean, do more with less is not, I don't think it's working too well. And I mean, I know that people cram at the last minute to get ready for one of these. I certainly recognize the resource is a major problem because it is an expensive process to go through if done properly. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. um, so on one side, we're coming out with these new procedures on doing stuff, but on the other side, we see cut. It's budgets being cut, it seems like somewhere there's a disconnect. Well, I think that, you know, the DII COE and all of this, this effort to make a common infrastructure probably is an attempt to solve some of that or to alleviate some of that. If you had, if you had common software that you were running or a common approved, uh, an approved list of, of um, hardware or software that you could use, then it would at least lessen some of that effort that's required to do to do your to keep your site up to, to uh, date on your security and if you if you establish a baseline and you have a good <coughs> strong configuration control procedure that every time something changed you did document it then it shouldn't be such an effort at the end it's when you run out of time or whatever and you put something off that you end up in that situation where it becomes difficult to catch up and then it cost, then it costs time and money and I know it happens, but the other problem is staffing. I mean, it, it's the same situation they, where they say we need this information assurance, and, but you need to staff it. To me, I'm a computer. I spent all of my time up until the last year as a computer or an information systems officer. And now I'm, I'm in intelligence. But basically, you look at our career field in the Air Force being drawn down. So. You're, and so their staff, they're contracting so much of it out. If they contract it out, if they put the money there to contract it out, 
and we get the efforts completed, well then we could have this perfect world. But I don't know how we're going to, I personally, my opinion is, I don't know how we're going to do it. Yeah, I don't see a change. We've got new procedures, but I don't see a change. I don't know. I mean, I, th I think that they're trying, they're doing their best to try to do it and make it simple and make it more cost effective to, to do it. And I think if they think if, they, if you could streamline the procedure some, get everybody on board in the beginning with signing these agreements, it might be easier in the end. Because I think part of the problem occurred when um, people didn't participate in things in the beginning, didn't participate in the development, and came in in the middle somewhere with some new requirement that perturbed everything. But by getting an agreement signed in the beginning, then that maybe precludes some of that. But does it solve it all? Probably not. Good sound, but, but like they come out with an NT patch every week. Right? Trying to, to keep up with the system administrator on what's the latest patch and which patches require patches and mm -hmm. still be able to handle the service calls you get is darn near impossible. I know. Um, and I work for Navy Command, and Navy's made the decision pretty much to go with NT. And you talk to the administrators, and NT requires 25% more system admin than a Nobel system. But they didn't look at that, and they're looking no. to cut the, the number of people. But they look at NT probably in its market and <coughs> where it is versus Nobel. And they say, well, there's a big market share for NT. Let's go to NT, perhaps. I mean, that may be part of the decision. And I know what you're saying. It doesn't necessarily mean it's yeah, easier. It's the same thing faster. With DMS when they said, thou shalt use exchange. We're not going to give you the option. Right. Karen, in your experience, is the life cycle management being process being applied anywhere in the DOD? I know we don't apply it here. You mean, well, I, and I would think if you take NT as an example, um, people who mandated that we uh, shift to that under IT21 uh, must have had some feel or at least consider what the impact on manpower was going to be on training. And yet, there's been no allocation <laughs> of resources to accommodate this. I'm not. I'm not sure I would go as far as saying that they looked at all those things when they changed NT. I mean, it would be interesting because how would they justify, you know, the expenditure of additional manpower resources, for example, versus some N95 extra patches versus what they had? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how these processes are being done, how this the thinking and the analysis is done. I can't answer that, but it's. It's just happening. Is, is and life cycle management an issue at, in your experience? I mean, do people actually try to apply those principles where you think? In the bigger systems, they do. Contractor, I'm working for Lockheed Martin on a, on a system, and we look at it. We look at the life cycle management. One of the things we have to do in building the system, building the security in the system, is to look at the life cycle maintenance of it. Is the system easy enough to maintain? I mean, if you build a security so complicated that, it, that you can't, no one can maintain it, then our creditor is not going to credit the system. So I can s speak from that s standpoint that some of the major, big, major systems, absolutely, they're following life cycle management. And they have the 5,000 series regulations, acquisition regulations, and, the, and um, the DOTUS instruction has different, in the different, um, milestone decision points, what has to be there, and what security documentation has to be there, and, and that. And um, I would say some of the, the DOTUS community would follow that, especially given that they're going to, to fulfill a mission, an intelligence mission area, say, with one particular system, and that system's going to go everywhere. Then they will pay attention to that. But the smaller systems and the smaller efforts, I am not certain on that. I've spent most of my time in the larger system developments where it did, they did worry about that. So I can't say. Yes, Cynthia. Can you comment on the um, fact that a lot of DOD systems are now being um, connected to coalition partners and how that affects um, accreditation? I know you can't. It compliment, complicates it a lot. <laughs> How do we 
figure out whether we want to connect with somebody else. I'm not sure I can answer that fully, but I, and I'm not sure about the allied creditors. I know that some of the systems do have releasable information that gets released to foreign nationals. Some of the systems, for example, um, run on your network that have releasability to multinational forces and things like that. So every system is looked at specifically and how it's going to operate and how its information is, is input and output input to the system and output from it and um, its connectivities to other systems. So everything is really based, the decisions are based on the individual system and the application and the environment. So I don't know if there's any standard policy written on it yet, which maybe that would be something they ought to consider. And um, as far as the other countries are concerned, I know there's some countries I'm sure that have accrediting or CNA processes like we do, the Brits probably do, for example, but I don't know about all of them. And then when you get into some of the multinational forces, you wouldn't necessarily have an accreditor from each country. You might have one that represents all of them. So that gets a little bit more complicated because now you have to look at the policies across the countries. So it, everything is done on an individual system basis at this point, I would say. Does anybody have any more questions? Well, thank you. Stay tuned for all the latest regulations. And if you, there's, like I said, there's a DITSCAP course. If you want to take it, you can spend a couple of days probably. I don't know how long it is, but Cynthia will have some more backup slides if you want any more information. For, the, yeah, for those of you who are uh, really interested in, in Delving into this more, we've got the bids cap, we've got the backup slides, and, and the slides that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Burke uh, presented here uh, today. And uh, she'll be here for a little while longer, so if you want to come down and, and discuss the accreditation process, uh, please feel free to. So I'd like to thank her for taking the time out from her busy schedule and coming down. Thank you.